Uh, our next speaker, Martin Hoffman, is the Managing Director of Biotech Flow. His presentation is a case study, Overcoming the Design Challenges of Expanded Bed Absorption Columns. So I'd like to bring uh, Martin up to, the, up to the podium here, and we'll get started with his presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name's Martin Hoffman. I'm MD of uh, Biotech Flow. Um, we design novel chromatography columns and skids. Primarily, our focus is on production scale chromatography columns. This afternoon, I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk about a case study of a customer who came to us with a number of challenges for an expanded bed chromatography column. Okay, on this slide, you can see this expanded bed chromatography column is different to what you might see uh, if you looked up papers, if you looked at Streamline and the GE uh, Streamline columns, you'll notice there isn't a piston in the production scale. But first of all, I'll explain expanded bed or EBA. We take from a five or 10,000 liter fermenter the whole cells in this particular study. The uh, anti monoclonal antibody, the MAB is secreted into the supranatant. So the whole cell broth with intact viable cells is pumped on to the expanded bed. The media is upfront's robust media, which is a tungsten carbide agarose protein A media. The flow in this column is always upflow. There are no meshes. There is no moving of a piston down and elution in a smaller volume by going downflow, as was the streamline. The elution is in expanded mode. It's very important. Because what we were doing, we were diluting after eluting, and it was not necessary. Okay. In, in expanded bed, the uh, product viable cells, target molecule, are pumped through around the media. The media captures the, uh, the MAB, and what leaves are host cell protein, cell debris, phospholipids, and DNA. Okay, when we received this request for quotation, these were the challenges. The maximum overall height of the column had to be two meters. But there was one meter piston adjustment required at this pilot scale. Also, we had to design a head, an outlet that did not, that prevented the formation of vortices. Vortices would cause the media to leave and go into the skid, which was bad. It had to be a zero dead space piston seals. And one of the reasons we were called in is because we work a lot with ultrasound. The column, the customer wanted ultrasound sensors, which can be adjustable to monitor the flow and the position of the expanded bed. Single use inlet and outlet. Time to delivery was six months. You can see on the top here, we received the order on the 21st of December and we had six months to design from scratch and ship and get to site. Okay, let's look at these columns. If we used an, a standard design, the column was asked, needed to go from 200 millimeter bed height to 1.2 meter bed height. So if we design the columns as these are shown here, the column had to be over two meters because there wasn't this rod through the center to hold the piston square. At, at the 1.2 meters, it goes to 2.7 meters. So it would not have fitted in this particular airlock. This shows it diagrammatically. At the bottom of the column, which you'll see later, is a gearbox a motor and a distributor. The blue shaded areas are the two bed heights and the adjustable mount is one meter. So if we use the piston with a rod, 
it would go well above the yellow line, which is our height for the airlock. So, what did we do? Before we, before we go on to that, we have to see the column had to be made of acrylic, not steel. The acrylic had must not have any affinity for the agarose tungsten carbide protein A beads. We, did, we looked at the formulation of our, agar, of our acrylic and found an acrylic with its FDA USB 6 certs that worked, but then we couldn't make it because it needed to be 1.5 meter long tube. Um, eventually we found, which, and I'll show you some photos, of a company that had an autoclave in Runcorn in the UK. The, the autoclave was three meters in diameter, was big enough for our particular tube. We went for inflatable seals, which you'll see later, which had to see six bar. So instead of working to ASME stroke PED, which would give us a nine millimeter wall, we went for a 25 millimeter wall, a one inch wall, which under PED and ASME would be eight bar. Albeit the column was rated at three bar because of the belly, bellying effect in the center. We used unique molds and a one two meter lathe in the UK was able to we could offer up our tube to it. Now, this is that uh, autoclave. It's three stories high. It's the uh, acrylic monomer, and we actually use an oligomer as well. It gives us a resistance to 40% ethanol, where the, uh, there is no change in UTS, because we use an oligomer as well as a monomer. Uh, this on the far right, you can see a tube as it comes out of the casting. And that we have to put on a two meter lathe. That's why it was quite difficult to make. This is the first one which had a, which had a one millimeter air bubble actually, and we had to reject. And that took 10 weeks to make. Eventually, we made the two tubes. We got two that were okay. So that's the first challenge over with. The next challenge was the piston. In this column, at this diameter, it was for pilot study and for phase three production. So we used a piston to find out what bed height we needed. As I said before, there are no meshes, the process is always upflow. So if in the column with a stirrer we got a vortex, when we had vortices, the, the tungsten carbide media left the column, went straight out of the top and stack, stuck to all the pipe work in the GE skid. So that was one of the big things, to stop the formation of a vortex and air must leave freely and the piston must move one meter at 2.5 millimeters per second. Failed safe is just a system of relief valves. This is the piston design we came up with in the photograph on the left, you can see in the center is a peak anti-jet device. And you can see the piston, that anti-jet device is actually on the media side, on the column side. And you can see that the, cent the piston profile is at an angle to ensure air leaves and the uh, product leaves completely. You can see on the right, the piston in situ. I'll return to the seals later. Piston assembly. This piston is quite complicated. You can see us putting it together here. You can see on the top right, the seal is a C-shaped seal with a very thick middle section, which pushes against the wall. And the two outer sections form a zero dead space seal. There are two of these in the piston, which you'll see in a moment, a lower and a higher. We use an eye bolt screwed into a TC connector for moving the piston in and out of the tube. And just to look at our progress, from the 21st of December to the 17th of March the following year, we've finished the design. There are some iterations on it at this point, but you can see the column tube units and the uh, rotating mixer are all designed and installed. 
piston seals. Those seals, on the piston are two seals. They've got to perform four things, not just seal. First of all, they seal. Then, because there is no rod holding the piston in place and square, we have these two inflatable seals that ensure the piston is square to the tube and will hold in place without slipping one way or the other at four and a half bar. That's the ASME test pressure. Okay, we also need to be able, because we're making an injectable, we need to just clean behind the seals. So when we release the pressure on the inflatable seals, the, the seals reduce by two millimeters in OD, giving us a free one millimeter gap to clean behind them. But you'll see in the next photo, I think, we have a zero dead space as well, a knife edge. Yeah, this one. On the left are a delivery of seals. Some of them we rejected. Our rejection level is high, was high until we had a new tool made. And now the seals come out beautifully. On the right, at the very bottom, below the black seal, is the column, is the bed. And there we have a zero dead space. The thick black line in the center of the seals is what holds the piston in place. So we, that piston can see four and a half bar, and at six bar, this thick center in the two positions on each, the two seals hold it in place, and you see the thin black lines are our zero dead space. This seal is at six bar. If we reduce it to 4.5 bar, it still holds, but we can move it up and down with pressure and then we reduce it to zero bar, and the seal comes away from the wall, we have a manhole, manhole, and then we can flush behind it. As it says here. The, inside those seals is a steel carrier ring to ensure the steels, seals stay square. Okay, here's a video to show you the whole thing. I'll, I'll, Oh, you can see, uh, here's the column. You can see the piston moving down. Air pressure above it, liquid below it, two inflatable seals in tandem keeping the piston square. This is the inlet at the bottom. It rotates and jets our cell slurry downwards against the bottom. Far, okay, you can see them moving around here. And you can see the piston going down. The upper chamber is airtight. And there's the piston moving down times eight. It moves down beautifully square. That's very important. Half a bar moves the piston. And here we see the piston. And there's the antijets in situ. The ultrasound housing, the ultrasound sensors, I will talk about in a moment. There they are. We have eight on our bigger columns. That's the speed, two and a half millimeters a second. The piston moves more than one meter in this mode. Here we see the seals, top and bottom. Right, this is a harvest loading. Remember, this is upflow, so this has been through the bed. There we are, putting the harvest on. And here we're eluting host cell proteins, DNA, cell debris, and here's the map. You can see it's very concentrated. 1.34. And here's a typical map trace. And the strip at the end. Okay, it's a short video, but it gives you a chance to look at the whole column. Okay, the top anti-jet, the beige-colored peak device. The first one we made didn't work. The point of that device is as an, it is an outlet as well as breaking a vortex. This is the first one we made. We made this one in steel, actually. It is based on, I'll go up. It's based on the, uh, these two references, which are actually from storm drains in the States here. These are storm drains and swimming pool drains. It's the only reference I could find on anti-vortex outlets. Um, the outlet holds the anti-jet rod we just did by sticking rods on top. I'll just show you. That's the first one. The vortex is formed. Air didn't leave very well and the media left the column and fouled the skid. 
but we had the angle of these veins correct. And what we did is we found that if we put a, uh, uh, the original peak rod on top of the first anti-vortex device, we broke the vortex. It pushed into the swirling vortex. So just by making this nose a certain length, it's quite a robust parameter, we completely stopped vortices at 450 centimeters an hour flow rate. So this was our final design used in production now. Ultrasound. We use eight ultrasound transceivers on our larger column, six on this 300. This monitors the position of the piston, the height of the clear supernatant. It monitors where the expanded bed has expanded up to. That's why we have six. And it as we put on the sample, the cells, the harvest, if you like, the viscosity is higher, pressure drop goes up, it disturbs the expanded bed. So we have to be, have a very nice smooth dropping down of flow rate as the high viscosity sample is put on and then a very nice ramping up of flow rate to keep the bed expanded. And we do this with these ultrasound probes watching the movement of the top of the bed, which you'll see in a picture later. This works very well. Okay, this is our, from our patent. We are actually using it now in the analog mode. So we can actually see the concentration of the monoclonal antibody in there. Because we have a linear relationship to ultrasound um, attenuation and concentration of MAB. There is a paper, I, I, I have a paper in the Journal of Chromatography on uh, monitoring concentration of MABs and salts using ultrasound. So we've, we've, we've done that, we've proven that, and we are now using it to, to monitor the map coming off, and we can put the ultrasound transceiver, these eight little crystals, where we like, and watch as different components come off. It's a universal detector. We can see salt fronts, buffer, the, uh, uh, and the proteins as they come off, and cells. The mountings are the key to this because the ultrasound, the, these zirconia crystals have to marry perfectly to the tube wall, the chromatography column tube wall. The column tube is 350 millimeters diameter OD. So we actually machine the crystal off at a curve that is the same as the curve of a 350 millimeter circle. And then they marry to the tube. Okay, I'm gonna to go to this picture here now. We do it using thinner, on our, our next size column, we do thinner tie bar, bars that hold the column tube flanges onto the column. We use these as a spring. So number 11 is the tube, is the steel tube you can see on the right, that's point 11. That acts as a springy fulcrum to push 51, the ultrasound crystal, against the wall and the other side of the, the beam is 53, a screw, which we tighten against the tube and it pushes the zirconia crystal beautifully against the wall. This picture below, these black coal looking pieces, are tungsten carbide. This is why the media is black. Tungsten carbide in agarose and the agarose is protein A agarose. So the tungsten carbide there is there to make the media three times heavier than water to enable it to be expanded with flow at 450 centimeters an hour. Okay, this is the inlet device at the bottom because if you remember the flow is always upflow. This turns around, you can see the triclamp at the bottom. There is a uh, bearing so that the uh, elbow stays in the same place. This turns at 16 to 25 revolutions per minute. The uh, mobile phases and the uh, cell, the product sample, the cells are injected through a number of holes underneath these rods. So it injects it against the bottom and it turns, thereby mobilizing, expanding the bed two times. And it's very stable. And the, the rotation of this can also be controlled 
by the ultrasound. Now, this, this, is, this is quite interesting. We found a variation in uh, our plates per meter, which turned out to be how well we had squared the column up. Just using a spirit level, we realized it wasn't accurate enough. So we used a quite a complicated plumb bob and found that if we go along the top, at 90 degrees, we have 147 plates per meter. But we go half a degree out from the vertical and we've dropped dramatically to one of, not dramatically, we've dropped 107. I, I can't really, I haven't got my glasses on. If we drop to 88, so we're over like this, we're, uh, we are a quarter of our efficiency. So what we've done is, on our production columns, on the larger ones, we've put an inclinometer. We've been working on this for a year and three months to get this inclinometer correct. It sounds easy, but it's not easy. But we've got an inclinometer that is accurate to 0 0.005 degrees. This inclinometer is one used on cranes to keep cranes, tall cranes straight. It's not used in our industry, but it's the only one that would do what we wanted to do. And this is now, I have one of these on my desk in my office, and we're fitting it to a 600 column uh, in a couple of weeks time. It's a beautiful piece of kit. And it will feed back to uh, the GE skid, which is the process skid being used in this. Uh, and um, it will sound alarms. It's also, we're also putting it on our standard columns in Japan for uh, earthquake, uh, earthquake zones, as well as squaring the column up perfectly rather than a spirit level, which is what we're used to on chromatography columns. Because remember, expanded bed columns are very tall. So a small a half a degree is quite a big amount on a two meter com column. Okay, we delivered it. I, was it, uh, Andy was here around, it was around about the 1st of July, wasn't it? Thanks, Andy. <laughs> yes. So we did it in just about six months. And this is the, from our customer, the antibody titer coming off 1.34 grams per liter. Uh, uh, the media, 22 gram per liter. Okay, this is quite nice. The expanded bed giving us 82% yield versus 70% on a clarification, and then protein A, then IEX, HIC columns. Manufacturing time at the end, 6.8 hours on the expanded bed and 18.5 hours on the traditional way. Okay. This is just to remind you that we're not in, in the column we're manufacturing and which we're, we're going to uh, full production with this 600, there is no piston. It's a fixed column because we do not need to compress the media. First of all, it causes channeling, which was always a problem with the streamlined column on the larger size. Um, and also, our feedstock is, had to be diluted after we moved the piston down anyway. So we have a very nice, we're using expanded bed in a slightly different way, which has got rid of the problems that um, we, we encountered on the uh, pilot column. And you can see here, we're coming off at 1.34 grams per litre, uh, smaller volume, obviously. Uh, removal of DNA and HCP host of proteins, both are good. Okay, uh, conclusions, buffer volume is virtually half the volume of buffer is used when we go for EBA because we don't need that clarification, we don't need those extra columns, it's a lot quicker, product concentration is higher, our throughput, our flow rate is 450 to 500 centimeters an hour. And of course, we've had no filtration, we go, we put the cell debris cells straight on the column, the cells coming off these columns are viable, they go back. They're installed in CGMP facilities. Uh, there's one missing here, there's one in Canada, Europe, Australia, quite a few. They're all in phase three, and 
the ones we're making at the moment are actually full production. Thanks to Petra Hall, Pete Dembon, Jack Vandermeer Pathian, and Andy Davis for all the work he did and the support he gave me. Thanks, Andy. Okay. Questions? Thank you.